uh, exist. Indeed. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's event on uh, the existing tools to prevent run evictions. Um, a th special thank you to our speakers for agreeing to participate in our event. Um, so this is a joint event between Fienza and the International Union of Tenants. Um, so I'm Alice, I work at Fienza. This is the European Federation of National Organizations working with the homeless. So our goal is to end homelessness in Europe. Uh, the International uh, Union of Tenants is a non-governmental uh, organization representing uh, tenant organizations in 47 countries that advocate for tenants' rights and interests. So quickly, how, um, why we decided to co-organize this event. Um, at Fienza, our work on building renovations uh, mainly focuses on um, social service providers who need to renovate shelters and housing, for example, and low-income households uh, who live in adequate situation or struggle to, uh, with rising rents. So with the renovation wave, this is the EU uh, initiative to double the renovation rates to cut emissions in the EU, we see that there is an increasing risk of evictions due to renovations in Europe. And uh, we are currently writing a briefing with the Metropolitan Research Institute on the existing mechanism to prevent renovations in Europe. So with today's event, we wanted to hear the voices of key actors that witnessed the impact of renovations and propose solutions to combat them. So now we'd let the floor to uh, Ms. Marilina. So Ms. Marilina, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marie Linder and I'm the president of the, the Swedish Union of Tenant, but I'm also the president of the International Union of Tenant. Uh, I think we have a situation right now in the housing sector. We have it for several years where a lot of big investments uh, have gone into the housing sector and tried to to earn so much money on the housing sector. Uh, and we see uh, that the, the consequences of that is uh, the people that are living in it, uh, it's uh, due to renovation. Uh, they can't stay uh, uh, longer after the renovation. I wonder now, because the economy is changing right now, I, I thought when I was preparing for this uh, session, is the party over and what will happen when these big companies will leave the market? What will happen to people in all the houses right now? Uh, I, think the, I think we will see uh, quite a change of situation. But today's subject <clears throat> is about renovations. And I must say, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, even if I'm in Sweden or if, in, if I meet in a, any other country, we see this problem with renovation uh, that became renovations as a problem in every country. <clears throat> in Sweden, uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, researchers was uh, recently describing the renovation situation in Sweden as a ticking bomb. They have identified a development in which renovations are undermining people's right to safe housing. While re renovation is a natural part of the life cycle of any building, it must be done with agreement with the people living there in became sustainable. In connection with the necessary renovation, many landlords take the opportunity to make standard raising measures, which are not necessary, but increases rents to the point where tenants are forced to move. Uh, this is a problem that the Swedish Union of Tenants have seen developing in Sweden over a long time not least as in the big cities where we now see how ex, uh, extensive renovation has caused massive rent increases, leading to renovations that people can't stay in their flats after uh, uh, their uh, apartment has been renovated. Uh, it also a, a problem that's emerging in Europe as well. In order to realize the rights of everyone to a good housing at an affordable fair rent, we have to work together to address this, this, the issue of renovations. The renovation wave that EU is calling for, and uh, it's necessary that it will be done, 
can be seen as a unique opportunity to form the housing market of tomorrow and a housing market that everyone could have a safe home. But this great opportunity also comes with a risk because when the renovation wave starts, we will live with the results of it for decades. Therefore, it's uh, there, it is therefore the most utmost importance to consider that people, that the people living in their homes today can continue to live there tomorrow. And I will come to come back later on what kind of suggestion the uh, International Union of Tenant have uh, uh, about this question of renovation. Uh, but I say it's a most important question both for the tenants and for a safe housing, but we also need to talk about renovation uh, within the question of climate change and how we can do it uh, without uh, affecting the climate. And I stand there. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, so my name is Clotilde Clarkfulti. I work for Fianza. I'm working on energy poverty together with Alice and I will be moderating this event. Um, I just want to thank again the speakers for, for joining. It is a very relevant and important meeting for us now, as explained by Alice in the context of the renovation wave, the mandatory energy performance standard in the EPPV. And um, so at Fianza, we, we wanted to know more, learn more about uh, what is the reality of uh, renovation in Europe and what are the potential mechanisms to, uh, to prevent it. So we will have two panels. Uh, the first one will be looking at uh, national realities and uh, what's happening there. And the second one will be a bit more of a global European and international perspective. So to start with, we will have uh, three speakers. So the two first one will be from the Southern Thorn University in Sweden. Um, also Ricard, uh, yes, and uh, Dominika Polanska. You are researcher specialized in the issue of uh, renovation, tenant uh, mobilization, and you will tell us a bit more about uh, what is the context of renovation in Sweden and um, some of your recommendations to, to address this situation. And then we will hear from Claudia Chamber, uh, who is a member of parliament uh, of Dartmouth South, uh, so in Canada, in the province of Nova Scotia. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we are very excited that you're here because Nova Scotia has actually implemented the ban on renovation. And we want to hear from you, how did that happen? What were the limits of this mechanism? Did it work? What was the social impact? And uh, we have a lot to learn. So um, I will first give the floor to the, the Swedish team, if that's okay, for 10 minutes. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. My name is Dominika Polanska and I work at Södertörn University and actually at Uppsala University as well. And I have my colleague with me. Yeah, I'm Åsa Rickard, PhD student at Uppsala University, writing on a dissertation on feminist perspectives on run evictions. <coughs> and I will now share our presentation here. Uh, so there is a lot to say about renovations in Sweden, but we only have 15 minutes. We were instructed for 15 minutes, so I hope you can bear with us for 15 minutes. And we will share some of the results uh, of our research. Uh, we have mainly done quali qualitative activist research in renovation neighborhoods uh, since 2011. Uh, we have observed that uh, research in institutional settings lack an understanding for renovation processes. And this is what we will try to share with you uh, today. Yeah, and uh, regarding our research, we work qualitatively with tenants as co-researchers in processes of mutual learning. We have uh, some academic publications that we show in the end, which, uh, but we also see this as a process and we work continuously with meetings. We organize uh, meetings for, uh, for the stakeholders. We work with media and we have also produced uh, educational tools and handbooks to be used by tenants in renovation neighborhoods. Mm. And the article that Marie mentioned in the beginning uh, was actually signed by, by us amongst others, uh, the researchers that uh, 
yeah. pointed to renovation as a social social bomb, ticking bomb. Yes, so we go back in time about 12 or 13 years. Uh, this is a magazine, one of many at the time. Media raised the issue in red, you can read here, aging suburbs demands billions. So around 2010, uh, there were a discussion about renovation of multi-family rental housing, the Swedish case. It's been going on for years, but now here around 2010, it sharpened because it kind of collided with the state demand of energy efficiency in the built environment, stating that the energy efficiency in the built environment had to be decreased by 50% to 2050. So this was a wide debate, mostly driven by media actually. And uh, what they have in common is that um, they were, this idea of, I mean, there was a need of renovation of about half a million multifamily uh, housing, housing that had lacking maintenance for many years. Uh, in this discourse around 2010, uh, they targeted primarily marginalized neighborhoods and also talked very much about technique, energy, and economy related to renovations. Uh, but me and Dominica and others who study this phenomena, uh, we would say that what is going on is, now you have, yeah, renovation. <laughs> so uh, this is renovation. I will not talk about what it is because uh, Marie Linder already did. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can, yeah, that's it. So what's been going on since uh, 2010, Dominica? Okay, so. To give you some of the context, uh, reports show that uh, 400,000 uh, renovations have been carried out in Sweden since 2013 or between 2013 and 2020. And we have seen sharp rent increases uh, in these renovations. Uh, the National Audit Office has reported on the renovations being unnecessarily extensive, calling them over renovations. And this is often combined with years or decades of lack of maintenance in the housing stock. Uh, from ours and uh, other research, uh, we conclude that extensive renovation cause mental and physical illness, relocation and unrest in residential areas, housing segregation and inequality. And we have also noted a lot of resistance and struggle for politicizing of renovations, which is one of the central research themes we have developed. So how unique is Sweden? Internationally, Sweden has been renowned as a comparatively fair uh, in its uh, welfare policies, uh, also in its housing system. Um, where strong tenants' rights have been uh, like in focus. But since 1990s and ongoing, there are strong deregulations, which has led to a marginalizing of rental housing as a form of living, as tenor. Uh, also, uh, there's a new legislation that's central here in 2011, a legislation that is harmonizing with the EU legislation uh, that has, uh, together with the other deregulations, opened up for these renovations or for these renovations, these 400,000 that has been done. Um, and actually, what we uh, do uh, see is that this legislation was to be run to according to business life principles and state reports actually uh, a few years ago show that these renovations are too extensive. They do too much. They do more than they need to do. And also the research show that these renovations are actually performed with inadequate quality, both in the performance and in the material used. So we're actually raising questions here uh, are these renovations even environmentally uh, sustainable? And uh, remembering the motif uh, in 2010 and around given for these renovations of energy efficiency, 
we have to ask, are these renovations really energy efficient? Uh, in order to understand how renovations are carried out in a specific national context, it is important to look at the legal framework and legal practice. And uh, uh, so there is uh, the law and legislation can be both national and supranational, uh, but we will focus on the national uh, level here. Um, the national law in Sweden is regulating the relationship between tenants and property owners, but there is also a loophole. Uh, in the Swedish use value system, allowing for steep rent increases. Uh, legal practice plays an important role to deepen this loophole. We ref refer to legal practice in rent tribunals that are mediators in conflicts between uh, property owners and tenants. And we should remember that legal practice is an interpretative practice, is based on interpretations. Uh, so the research I have carried out in the last two years shows that the outcomes in renovation cases uh, in the rent, rent tribunals are very much biased and one-sided. These are one-sided interpretations that are favoring owners and ownership. So me and Dominika and others have been uh, researching this since 2011. And recently, we are actually taking seriously the relational perspective of the housing politics. So now we are just, uh, researching renovations in co-ops and rental housing. Co-op is a form of owner-occupied multi-family housing in Sweden, uh, very close to ownership. And our findings, this is coming research, find, uh, findings is that in the co-ops, where the residents have formal influence uh, through representative democracy. These renovations lead to cautious and small scale, cheaper and energy efficient structural renovations. Whereas in the rental housing, where tenants have primarily symbolic influence lead to large scale rent raising renovations causing renovation. And our research indicates that these past 10 years of renovations contribute to an increase in tenor inequality in Sweden. And central in, in these studies are that for both of these tenors, uh, tenants express that stability and control over one's home is central. The right to stay put is central for stability and safety in these processes. So to sum up, based on our research, we would like to raise some suggestions on how to stop renovations from this Swedish case. Uh, one such fund fundamental point is to organize, create allies, make visible the issue of renovation. Uh, we think that broad alliances politicizing the issue are needed because these can facilitate a close understanding of these processes and understanding that has been lacking in research, but also in, among civil society and in policy. Uh, rent control, rent cap on rent increases are common suggestions when it comes to rent evictions. We agree that profit making on housing should be regulated, but also regulation of property owners' continuous maintenance of housing uh, should be in place, as it is lacking today, not only in Sweden, but also in the rest of Europe, according to studies. Um, state subsidies to renovation are needed and should be combined with clear conditions for continuous and adequate re renovations and maintenance. Law and legal practice should be scrutinized and changed accordingly, and tenants' rights strengthened. Home is a human right, not a commodity, and all should have a de the democratic right to have influence over one's home. Uh, we also need progressive housing policies, not state or private sector led gentrification projects. Uh, policies taking into account knowledge on the outcomes and societal costs of displacement. Uh, policies not afraid uh, of the critical questions regarding climate impact that renovations have. Finally, we should focus on good practices where property owners are renovating in a socially and environmentally sustainable way.
over to Ose. Uh, yeah, so this is actually just a list of some of our research uh, that is in English. We also have some in Swedish. Um, uh, but, uh, well, I'm not going to go through this. This is what we base this presentation on, and we are still working on, on trying to understand renovation in Sweden, in the Swedish context, and really, really call for uh, similar research in other contexts, like because these kind of renovations uh, or these kind of evictions that it is, uh, play out differently, of course, in, in uh, every uh, national context. So, but if you want to take part of this, you can uh, call us or uh, on internet on, with mail. These are our mails. So just give us a keep in touch and we can send you the list. Of and thank you very much for having us. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for, for organizing this and for connecting this energy efficiency and the social sustainability. It's really important. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it's, it's really timely for us to be able to bring in your, your research. Um, what I would suggest, I forgot to ask uh, participants to please take a, an active role in, in the webinar. Uh, feel free to put questions in the, in the chat box or to raise your hand and, and we can give you the floor. But what I would like to ask is maybe Claudia Chander to jump in now with a presentation and, and we will take the question to all a few three speakers after one. Um, and I heard Dominica making the, the reference to rent cap as one of the solution. And I know in Nova Scotia, so you had a 2% rent cap as well. I don't know if you'll be able to touch upon that as well as the ban on renovation. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, hello everyone. I think um, someone else is controlling my slides so we could put those up maybe. Uh, my name is Claudia Chender, and I am a member of the provincial parliament in Nova Scotia, which is a small province in Canada. Uh, there's just a million of us. And I will talk a little bit about our experience, which was mainly driven by COVID. Um, and so uh, what happened essentially, uh, this is just a slide of, this is sort of the mix of our housing. So uh, in Nova Scotia, we have very little co-op and social housing. We have very few uh, controls for renters, period. Uh, we do have um, some tenants organizations. Uh, but in general, as with everywhere, I think we are having a, a real rise in homelessness and houselessness. And this is being brought on by lots of different factors. Um, but a lot of it is the sharp increase in the cost of housing. And, you know, that is due, I think, to a lot of different factors, but among them just housing as an investment vehicle and the financialization of housing. And so we are sort of working on all fronts. And I think essentially what happened, and we can move to the next slide, is that when COVID uh, came in, um, we, uh, are we able to move to the next slide? Can you when, see it now? Yeah. Uh, no, it's the same one on mine. Um, COVID. Uh, I just see the same slide. Oh, no. The okay, there we go. Yeah, so, so when uh, COVID hit uh, in Canada, which was a little bit later, um, I think, than in Europe, we probably just by weeks. But at a certain point, all of the folks who have been advocating very loudly about said we don't have no rental presentation I think I'm so sorry I don't know why it's happening uh, I'm so sorry I'm gonna share it again um so, uh, sorry, I'll just try to continue here. I'll just, um, yeah, so, oh, last one. 
Yes. So, so because of COVID, uh, we we had a two percent rent cap and a rent and a rent eviction ban. Now, interestingly, in Nova Scotia, that rent eviction piece has not been explicitly connected to environmental retrofits, partly because I don't think our environmental targets have been as ambitious as in the EU, uh, but partly also because it's hidden. So Nova Scotia is still, unfortunately, quite reliant on things like coal and heating oil. Uh, we have a long way to go. And so in fact, there are a number of renovations that are changing those heating systems um, to heat pumps and electrifying. And I suspect that if we had the data, which we don't have, we would see that a lot of those renovations uh, were based on that kind of transition, but we don't have that information. I don't even know if we could get it, but but listening to the Swedish folks makes me really want it. Um, so, so this is sort of what happened. So the renovation ban came in and it was just, it just elapsed uh, just a couple of months ago. And as it was replaced with a new uh, legislative framework that is supposed to help protect tenants and make it more difficult for landlords to evict them. So we can shift to the next slide if that works. And so now we have a legislative framework where either there needs to be mutual agreement between the landlord and tenant, and that's formalized uh, in writing, or there's a hearing. So there's an application process that the landlord must go through, the tenant must be served the papers, um, and we can kind of run through these slides. So um, if you wanna go right to the next slide, so the landlord needs to have all the permits in place, it needs to either be for demolition or the repairs need to be so extensive that the tenant must be relocated. Um, you can move to the next slide and um, they get compensation. So the tenant will get compensation theoretically if they need to move or if they stay, they don't have to pay because of the disruption. And then you can go one more slide ahead. Um, and then, or they can move the tenant to another uh, unit. Now, our experience in the first two months of this is that it's almost useless, this legislation. And so when they brought it in, we said to them very clearly, this will not work. Because as everyone on this uh, call knows, I'm sure there is such a power imbalance between tenants and landlords. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, that you know as as a because this is provincial jurisdiction in canada so this is not a national jurisdiction it's provincial uh, we get so many calls every day and and so the reality is that it's what hap what's happening is that those hearings almost never take place because the landlord essentially either tricks the tenant into leaving um, tells them that they need to leave when they don't in fact need to leave or makes their life so miserable that they end up just going. So we can go one more slide ahead. So this happened just in my neighborhood. So the day that the that the rent eviction ban ended, uh, there were two multi-unit buildings, four units each, very small, that had recently been sold. And I knew that that meant that all eight families <clears throat> would be evicted. There are it's the kind of housing we want in communities. So there are seniors, there are young families, there are working professionals. It was a, a totally mixed. Um, and just the day after someone showed up at their front door and said, sorry, you need to be out by the end of the month. Now, luckily someone had the ability and the foresight to reach out to our office. And so we said, well, here's the process. Here's what you do. But I'll tell you that except for the woman in this picture and her children, everyone else has left before their hearing because between the, that day and their hearing, their heat source was cut off, their apartment flooded, they were subjected to power tools all day long. And, no, and, and so the big challenge is that uh, what I would say about legislative frameworks is that there's no enforcement. And so if there's no enforcement, how on earth will that work? Landlords are very savvy. They understand what they're capable of and and not, and so it so it 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 is not uh, it has not been successful so far. So if you want to move ahead one more, so what are the so what would work? 
Um, so one of the things uh, that would work, obviously, is you know, enforcement to what we were talking about. But one of the things that we are trying to pilot here that we're very intrigued about is this idea of how to renovate without displacement. So there's a group here called Recover, which is connected, actually comes out of a Dutch group called Energy Sproing, who has pioneered a way of doing environmental retrofits without displacement. So it's engineered panels that are placed on the outside of a home. Um, and you'll see like a solar roof coming down. Now this is still being piloted, but I think that it's a wonderful idea and it speaks exactly to this. We know we need to meet our environmental commitments, um, but this is a way that we can do it by employing a local workforce, uh, doing it in a more affordable way with less disruption and providing security of tenure to the tenants who live in these spaces. So if you wanna move forward one more. Um, there are examples uh, of things that have been successful. So the actually the federal government during COVID um, earmarked a whole um, several <clears throat> hundreds of millions of dollars to a rapid housing initiative. So acknowledging that this is a provincial area, but that we have a homelessness problem across our country, they put forward money through municipalities for projects that could be executed quickly in partnership with nonprofits serving the most vulnerable and not surprising and consistent, I would say, with the sweetest research, these co-ops and not-for-profit organizations are doing above and beyond what they need to do anyway. So as they build this new housing stock, they are building it to be as efficient as possible. They are building it um, to be as sustainable as possible and to serve the community needs in the best way. So this is one example but the number of units is really minuscule. So I think 137 in our province um, were built are, or are being built out of this money. So we can move ahead one more. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I think the, um, the Swedish team spoke to co-ops. I think what we see is that we need in Canada and in Nova Scotia, more what we call non-market housing. So that would be co-ops, that would be public housing, that would be nonprofit housing. We have lots of different vehicles that can accommodate that, but essentially housing that is not on the free market. Um, ideally co-ops, but in any of those um, schemes, either the tenants or the organizational board has a fundamental interest of security of tenure and serving the people living there and not of market forces. And so I think that that's incredibly important. So we work uh, tirelessly to expand funding to those sectors to build. Uh, one of the things we are working on is that as government funds go out for environmental retrofit and things of that nature, or just for housing period, because we need more housing supply to push the government to leverage those funds and to say, if you're going to put that money forward, then make sure that part of the condition of that grant is security of tenure for the people who are living there, is meeting our climate commitments, because this is public money. This is my money. <laughs> this is my constituents' money. And so how are you spending it? We want to understand that. Um, and of course, we will continue to push for stronger legislation, as well as enforcement of that legislation. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's the last slide or if there's one more. I, I, no, I, that was the last slide. That's the last one. Yeah, so, so I think that's it in a nutshell. There's lots more that could be said, but essentially, you know, our experience was that the rent eviction ban worked um, and was important. But of course, we also understand, as this conference is discussing, that we need these renovations and we need these retrofits. And so, you know, we have to not have those two things at battling with each other, but figure out how to accomplish those together. So I think there are some innovative solutions like the Recover Initiative and others. Um, but in the end, I think as much as we can recognize housing as a human right and push our governments and other organizations to, to legislate that, um, the further we'll get in this discussion. So thank you so much for having me. I know I'm a little bit of a fish out of water here in the European context, but I appreciate learning from all of you and to have the time to present our experience. Thank you very much for this very enriching example from Canada. 
Um, we have a question from Spain, from Ecodes. Uh, Javier, do you want to take the floor directly? Um, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, it, it was a, a general doubt regarding renovations and the scale of the renovation processes. Uh, I was wondering the, the opinion of the panelists regarding district renovation, if it's more, if it makes uh, renovations easier because it put pressure into a whole area of a city or a, of a rural area instead of just pinpointing some some uh, specific buildings in a in a city again or a rural area but at the same time if it's easier to control those renovation processes if the renovation process is carried out at a, at a larger scale there were some for example there are some examples from berlin that come to mind that actually control what they call the social cohesion or the social I don't remember the term in English, but that they, they there were some councils in the town hall that controlled that larger processes didn't produce that kind of uh, social social movement or something. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is basically, do you see a, a link between um, the intensity and renovation and the scale of the renovation project? Uh, and at the same time, if, if that larger scale meet, makes it more easy or easier or more difficult to control the renovation. Thank you, Javier. And, and my, my second question, my follow-up question will be on the, um, we saw the renovation ban uh, can be a useful tool to, to prevent renovation when it's um, tenant having to leave the building because of renovation. But what about the more um, uh, discrete just rent increase after renovation to compensate the renovation cost. Is there any mechanism to compensate that? So um, I would start maybe with uh, Dominica and, and Asa on those two questions. And please, participants, feel free to raise your hand or, or add question on the Q&A chat. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the question. Um, I think that the answer uh, is probably depending on the context. Um, in Sweden, I would say that regeneration programs, whatever you call them, renewal, urban renewal or counteracting segregation is all more or less connected to uh, private actors, but also uh, public actors nowadays, since the uh, law has changed in Sweden, making public housing companies profit driven uh, into making profits on, on, on these processes. And uh, as a consequence, uh, maybe oh, always intentionally, but we see this as a consequence displacing people. Uh, also, would you agree with me on that? Yeah, uh, definitely. And we, we have also seen like for these 10 years that the uh, as there have been uh, resistance locally and on different levels, like in Sweden, we have seen that the housing companies are actually changing their um, their tactics. Uh, they do they do their renovations differently today than they did 10 years ago 10 years ago they did like large scale renovations and took a whole neighborhood in the same time now they're more atomizing it and taking one apartment at the time and i just want to comment that these um from claudia's presentations these tricks that you presented that the housing company we we rec definitely this happens too, and I just um, me and Dominica wrote a paper about that about master suppression techniques that uh, housing company use. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, one other comment uh, to Claudia's presentation is that the legislation has been in place in Sweden uh, since the law changed in two thousand eleven, forcing public housing companies to actually have these kind of hearings, but we call them consultations. Uh, but also that. Uh, uh, tenants are seemingly protected by uh, this mutual agreement. But given the legal practice in the rent tribunals, giving property owners almost always exclusively the right to carry on with the reno renovation, this, this is a legislation that actually doesn't mean anything. And having this idea about strong tenants' rights in Sweden, we have a strong right to remain put in the apartments. It doesn't it's it's not um, 
uh, that's significant if you cannot afford the new rent uh, that might be you know, increased by 60 or 70%. So this is what we see at least in the uh, capital city, 60, 70% is more common than uncommon. And the other questions you need to, I think you need to remind us <laughs> about the other questions. Well, I, I think you, you answered, it was exactly about that when, um, when the renovation is not about ending the, the lease, but increasing the rents. Uh, how can you prevent that? Because it is another kind of renovation if people can't afford the new rents. Mm -hmm. uh, Claudia, do you want to, to jump in on one of those questions? Yeah, well, I'll just agree that, you know, what we see is a apartment by apartment approach increasingly, just as we've heard. Um, and, and that also uh, gives them a bit of cover. So, you know, that like one apartment gets done, the rent gets jacked up, another one gets done in a few months, it, the rent goes up. So, so I think the larger housing companies do that purposely. But that also leads to lots of challenges in a building because people know that their their neighbor is paying, you know, a huge percent less than them, maybe, and these issues. So on that point, in terms of, I don't know that there's such an experience of district renovations in that way here. Um, but absolutely, I think the the price going up is is a huge issue. So this is the rent cap that we have, which is set to expire. It's temporary. And what we have pushed for consistently is a system of rent regulation so that it's not a hard cap, because, of course, inflation is everywhere. And that includes maintenance and upkeep. And 2% might not be realistic, it might be different, but that those costs are scrutinized and that there is a system and there is, a, there is an amount at which it can't go up more than that. The challenge is that the loophole here in the, in the regulations is that people now are only putting forward fixed term leases. So people can only rent for one year and then the lease ends and then they need to sign a new lease. And that new lease can be whatever the landlord wants it to be because it doesn't relate to the old one anymore. And so that's also an area that we've been pushing on to say, we shouldn't have fixed term leases. It doesn't make any sense. If people want to quit after a year, they can, but we should give people the opportunity to have security of tenure. Thank you. I see two hands raised. So Mary first and then Asa, please. Uh. Thank you, and thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I think I think uh, I will come back to that, but I think that one of the most important issues is that uh, the tenants need right on their side, uh, like Dominic. Dominica just said, uh, today we don't have, uh, we have a strong law for, for tenants in Sweden, uh, but the law gets aside when you have renovations. And we have been struggling to get the, this kind of rights for tenants. We have been having a uh, in, investigation uh, for, from the government in Sweden but uh, it got, doesn't go through to parliaments. It's on the landlord's side. But I think it's important, not only in Sweden, not only in Europe, not it's all over the world. The tenants need the rights to to uh, to be able to uh, to stay in their home after renovations, uh, after renovations, uh, and that is the, the the biggest problem. So I think it's important that we have tenants organization that is working for the tenants' rights, uh, but we also need. Uh, uh, the law to stand on the tenant's side. That is very important. Thank you. Um, also, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to pinpoint uh, point two that uh, what we said that tenancy since the 1990s has been increasingly marginalized. That means that these houses have stood without maintenance. I mean, we meet tenants that haven't had any maintenance for 20 or 30 or 40 years. And of course, uh, this wears hard on the houses. And this is also something that has to be regulated. The tenant owners must be pressured to take care of their houses for social reasons, of course, because you wanna, you have the right to live in a house that works, but also uh, because that's the best way out of an energy efficient uh, way of thinking to main, have a maintenance on the house. 
if you have a window that is leaking, that is leaking energy, right? So that uh, was one thing. And the other thing is uh, these loopholes in the law that we're talking about and this almost cat and rat game that is going on between tenants and the landlord, where the landlord have extremely much more uh, power, is that uh, we need more uh, research that is in the neighborhoods because things are happening. I mean, our societies are changing and it, ha it happens here, you know? So you need more research, but you also need uh, like the institutions and the tenant organizations and uh, need to be active and like working very, very close to the tenants to understand and to see all these loopholes. Yeah, and that is actually, that is lacking in research actually. We need more of that. And the civil society organizations like the one you were talking about, Claudia, you see all these loopholes and it's because you're there, right? Thank you. Uh, I'm aware, uh, Claudia, you, you need to leave soon. And, and then the speaker, Marie, on the second panel will need to leave also quite soon. So maybe, Claudia, if you just want to conclude from, from your side, uh, as a policymaker, if, if you could uh, drive policy change in Canada, uh, what what would you what your priority be to prevent renovation? Well, I think, as I said, the priority, as um, Dominica said in her presentation, is really enshrining housing as a human right and really um, making that recognized at every level of government and policy that people deserve to have a roof over their heads and that it is government's job to help ensure that that happens and that they have security of tenure. So I think it comes back to that, um, but also at a policy level, I think it's addressing the power dynamics. It's the same political problem we always have is whose voice gets heard. <laughs> Um, and usually if it has money attached, it, it gets heard more. And so we have to change that dynamic. We have to ensure that people are, we are working for all the citizens um, and not just some of them. And, and also that we recognize that to the extent that it's seen as an economic issue, it's a massive economic issue, the homelessness epidemic that we have and the lack of secure housing that people have. And that impacts every corner of our social safety net from you know, not just housing, but healthcare and education and everything else. So that's the work that we are doing, but as we, I think are hearing, it's happening on many fronts. So I wish I could stay and hear from everyone else, but I, I've learned so much. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, bye. bye. We will go on a second panel now, but um, we we can open Q and A uh, to the first speakers as well later on. Um, and I'm very happy to to introduce the two next speakers. So you know already uh, Mary, who's the president of the Swedish Union of Tenants and the International Union of Tenants, um, will uh, take us about more about the tenants' right against uh, renovation and what can be done at international level. And then I'm very happy to welcome uh, Maria Aldanias, who is my colleague who works uh, at FIANSA, but really from the right perspective. Uh, so Maria is uh, managing the Housing Rights Watch uh, initiative by FIANSA, and uh, she has done a lot of work on uh, eviction and how to prevent them, and she will bring in this legal perspective. Thank you, uh, Mary. Uh, thank you very much. I will say something about what we do right now at the International Union of Tenants in the situation of renoviction and uh, what we can do to try to influence the question. Uh, uh, we do, um, I think it's important that you use the power in organization. Uh, we can do it uh, uh, on a global level, and uh, we have done it on a global level uh, uh, towards the United Nations when it's about the, 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 the right for housing, but also about the renovation wave. Uh, but, and we also, and, and we work a lot on uh, uh, towards the European Parliament. 
And then we gather our uh, members together and see what is the question that we need to attack and we make petitions and then we take them back to influence politicians. Uh, we also take them to media and make opinions about uh, the question. Uh, and uh, we need to work at uh, different kind of levels. We need to work at the European level, but every member needs also to, to, to work on the national level. We have to influence the government and the parliament uh, uh, to make sure uh, that the tenants have security and that they can have influence. Uh, uh, and um, right now we have a, a a working group, uh, the housing policy uh, working group of the EU EUT. We are uh, right now looking at the, the Green Deal, but also about the uh, energy effic efficient uh, in initiative. In it, I can't say that, but the energy uh, initiative, because uh, we know that it is important that uh, we need solutions that can come to every uh, member state in Europe. Uh, and uh, we also make pressure on housing companies. Uh, uh, most of the pressures we do, sometimes we do it on the European level, but I would say that most of it, we do it on the national level. Uh, and um, we also, uh, we have some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, goals that we have set up for uh, these questions about the tenants' rights uh, for renovation, we think it's important that uh, the states sponsor support uh, for sustainable renovation. It's important that public funding should be concentrated to public housing so that we don't get uh, the money to go away to, uh, into private companies. So that is one of the questions. Uh, that we are working with uh, right now. Uh, we, we are also working hard on the housing cost neutrality that should be the main principle of the EU Green Deal. Uh, that, and we also need to combine that with social and climate goal. Uh, so uh, the rent increases are fully balanced by the en energy saving uh, and to help prevent renovations. And the last point that we are working with is um, in, we also need to have the respect of the principle uh, of subsidiarity, because even if we work together and we gather our members and we try to influence the, uh, uh, the European Parliament, a lot of the housing decision, decisions are made in the national on the national level, so we also need to make decision on the national national level, and we also need to work in solidarity between the members in IoT uh, to uh, to accomplish uh, a situation that it does it doesn't uh, become uh, uh, renovation becomes uh, renovations. So uh, we need to work on different kind of levels. To, to, to do this uh, uh, and to influence uh, both on uh, European level, uh, but also on national level. Uh, and uh, it's important also to have the opportunity to uh, make, um, uh, to share uh, uh, the situation between our countries so uh, that we can, uh, if we have companies that go across countries, that we can, uh, that we can share experience uh, what will happen if we influence uh, the, the private landlords. So uh, we are, uh, we are uh, working right now with both the Green Deal and the energy efficiency, and we are also uh, uh, working with that uh, you, we should have national support for renovations. Uh, but then I should say, uh, unfortunately, in my own country, Sweden, we had this uh, contribution for uh, energy efficiencies, but uh, in this budget, it was gone uh, because the parliament wrote a uh, vote uh, uh, for the, the, these um, uh, 
uh, uh, this uh, uh, bidrag, this uh, um, uh, now I don't, uh, this this uh, uh, this uh, 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 the channels are, will not could could not take part of that because the, the our uh, parliament uh, voted down it and uh, so i think we will see now in in sweden that we have the situation that a lot of renovation will not take part because i think the increase the increasing of costs and also that we we don't know how we could be we could be, be able to take part of the green deal uh, that will be a, a problem but the most important thing for the iot is to work together and make influence of a lot of uh, the the politicians that make decisions both on the European level and on the national level. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Um, a lot of things to, to say on, on your intervention. Uh, I see first a comment from uh, the International Alliance of Inhabitants who, who really support what you said and propose a joint mobilization to require no eviction due to renovation projects, neither direct nor rent increase. Uh, then um, I had a question, maybe Cesare, I will give you the floor in one minute. I had a question myself, you spoke of housing cost neutrality. Uh, can you develop that? Do you have a, a financial, financial model behind that on how, how to, to make it possible? Because, um, and, and that's a question to, to, the, to, to you, Mary, but also to Dominica and I, I also. Uh, in Sweden, is public funding sufficient? Uh, because it seems the, the logical step for, for people like me who are not researchers is to imagine major public funding, major investments, so that the renovation cost would be covered by uh, public authorities and there is no need for a rent increase after that. Uh, is this happening in Sweden or not? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so no, what about but that that is one of our demands because we th we, we think that we need that kind of uh, uh, contribution from from the state but we also think it's important that the the green new uh, uh, the green new deal uh, becomes uh, that so the tenants uh, it's it's not it's going to not going to be the situation that tenants need to leave their flats because of that so it's that is one of the demands that uh, the international union of tenants is uh, uh, doing right now uh, against uh, um, towards the, the European Parliament. And the housing cost neutrality is this a concept you you have developed? Do you have uh, more uh, to say about it? Yes, we uh, we have uh, we have said that because we think it's in, in, important. Uh, we think uh, 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 we need to have. Um, because we, we are afraid that uh, uh, the, the Green Deal uh, uh, can come to uh, end up with that, that some people get uh, energy, uh, uh, lead to energy uh, uh, poverty. So we think it's, it must be, uh, uh, the cost ma must balance. And that's the, one of the demands on the parliament. Uh, perhaps I could, be, but I can send you more about the housing uh, neutrality cost, but we think it's important that it can't be like uh, that uh, tenants have to pay for that, so they don't uh, will be able to, to stay in their uh, apartments afterwards. So that's one of the demands that the uh, International Union of Tenants have. Thank you. Also, I see you want to take the floor. No, I just want to comment on this subsidies. Uh, there's no subsidies in Sweden for the renovation of rental housing. It was an attempt. Uh, there was a small subsidy a few years ago that was uh, that the housing companies could, or the owners could apply for, and almost nobody did. And that was because uh, it was really good, actually. It was like a cap. You could, if you get these subsidies, you cannot raise the rents so much. And uh, then nobody applied for it. And I think uh, this, this is really a problem. And it really, really shows this, what all of us know, that these housing companies place the environmental, no, the, the economic um, 
the economic sustainability for themselves <laughs> as the major uh, focus and uh, that they actually earn more by uh, raising the rents than by doing sustainable renovations. Um, I mean, we just have to, to, to deal with that, uh, which is difficult, of course. Yeah. Uh, but, oh, and and uh, there's an uh, inequality between uh, the tenant situation in Sweden and the I owned uh, the house owners in, in Sweden, because the house owners can every year have a, uh, tax uh, uh, tax loss for renovation their own uh, houses, but the tenants has zero from the state. That's very interesting. Thank you, Dominica. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, by pointing to what is actually not working in the Swedish context uh, in terms of tax policy that is uh, favoring uh, ownership and not rental housing, um, but also to the lack of funding of renovations, or there have been attempts, but very, very small. Uh, we, uh, if we focus on the suggestions that we want to bring forward in this panel, I think we should demand the state, if we are talking about the national level, to step up in terms of economic support for this kind of uh, uh, housing. Uh, and also acknowledge that uh, the business of renovation is quite lucrative. It's, it's profitable. Uh, housing companies uh, in Sweden, both public and private, are making large profits on renovating and tenants are paying for, for this. So returning to the, to the discussion on uh, housing cost neutrality, uh, or how to make it work in terms of costs, I think state should take uh, more responsibility. So not so pressuring politicians is good. Uh, but I think in order to pressure politicians, we also need to, to build social movements, uh, national and supranational. Uh, and returning to one of our points at the end of our presentation, you know, creating alliances and, and looking at what is actually happening on the local level and and combining all the different scales in in trying to understand how to counteract this also wants to join please yeah because i agree with you and i just want to uh, connect to it and say that and also actually to the comment here comment by uh cesar uh, to to place the tenant in center here i mean uh uh, we need uh, the states to step up, of course, but how to do it? Uh, we were talking about the human right to a house, yes, but uh, not but, <laughs> but but focusing on everybody's right to stay put. You do focus on the right, the human right to stay put, but you also give a possibility of under of seeing all these nitty gritty things that are going on in the neighborhood. If the tenants have a stronger position, uh, it will be harder to circumvent those uh, restrictions and whatever is in post. So uh, placing um, everybody's right to stay put in, in the center of these discussions is also important. Thank you. I need to jump in now because I know Mary needs to leave now at uh, 5.05. 5. So thank you very much for, um, for your input. That's really useful. Thank you for this cooperation with Shiamsa as well uh, on this topic. We will, uh, we will keep in touch and see how we can maybe cooperate on this idea of uh, yes. an alliance. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I think so too. I hope we will cooperate in, in the future. And uh, I think we need to work uh, for the tenants' rights, but uh, also with the question of uh, sustainable renovations. Uh, and so that tenants can stay, uh, we, we can stay in our homes. Thank you. Uh, so before going on to Maria, I wanted maybe to give the floor to Cesare Ottolini, who asked a, a comment uh, basically on this. Uh, International Alliance of Inhabitants and Joint Initiative uh, on Mobilization for No Eviction. Cesare, are you here? And do you want to take the floor? Uh, 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank Clotilde. Yes. yes. Thanks. Um, is a question. Uh, this question rise by our experiences with the tenants union. For example, in my country, in my town, in my city, we are struggling because uh, the landlord, the public landlord, is proposing the renovation of the neighborhood financed by the public. But uh, they are evicting, so we are mobilizing the people to granting uh, the security of tenure first, and the second, to have the same condition when the the, 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 the renovation uh, will be done. Uh, for that, it's not, uh, it's not easy. So we need uh, to have um, a European mobilization in order to uh, conceptualize and in order to have a concrete tool to grant the security of tenure and the security of cost. About the uh, neutrality, cost neutrality, it could be some misunderstanding. I put some, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if, no, later. Um, because uh, if the neutrality cost means that uh, the landlords grant the renovation at the expenses of the public, and then uh, thanks to this process could uh, Re-evaluate, upgrade their own their um, their real estate. Why we have to grant uh, to them to the landlords uh, more rents in exchange of the idea of uh, IUT, if I uh, understand, uh, is that uh, in exchange of the um, some uh, uh, to pay less. The, uh, the bills, the energy bills, uh, we could uh, grant more rents for the landlords. I think it's not the right way. It's better to go right and then propose that the neutrality cost means no more rents, uh, especially for the uh, project uh, paid by the public subvention. For example, the um, recovery plans. We have a lot of this kind of project. I don't know if in general in Europe uh, the different uh, tenancy union are struggling to maintain the same rents, to maintain the security, security of tenure. I think on that we could uh, build, we could discuss, we could mobilize the tenancy union in order to have a joint front to fight against, against uh, the uh, rent increase, against uh, the renovations at the local, national, and European level. European level, uh, we, have, uh, we will have uh, the next uh, forthcoming uh, uh, directive to yeah. energy efficiency. Why means for us as a tenants? Yeah, yeah, we're working on that with the International Union of, of Tenants, and we will keep in touch with your organization as well. I think there might be potential for, for cooperation on that, uh, definitely. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Cesare. Um, Excellent uh, initiatives. We, we have a question for uh, Dominica, but I will keep it until later on, so uh, we can already go on to the next speaker, who is uh, Maria Aldanias. So Maria, we spoke a lot about housing rights, and I'm very glad you're here because that's that's your domain. Um, can you uh, tell us about um, available tools at EU level and internationally against eviction? But also maybe even if you didn't prepare that, tell us more about your perspective on on the enforcement of housing as a right more more broadly. Thank you. Okay. I mean, that broadens the, the scope of my presentation much more. Come on, Clotilde, you should say that <laughs> before. Okay, well, the, the good thing about talking in the last place is that um, I can kind of summarize and mention whatever you've just said before me, so that, um, that, it's, um, that it's helpful. 
and um, and it connects and I can connect my presentation with the realities that you, you just presented. Um, so first of all, um, I would like to say that I prepare my presentation thinking uh, especially on uh, the private rental sector. So I'm um, and on individual landlords more than corporate landlords, but I, because I think that the moment we, that you speak about corporate landlords or you speak about social landlords, so the social housing sector, you're talking about something different. So uh, I just want to say that before I even start. Um, I'm going to, so my name is Maria Aldana, as uh, Clotilde said. Um, I'm policy officer at Fianza and I'm coordinator of uh, something called Housing Rights Watch. It's a network of activists, uh, lawyers, academics, activists working on the right to housing in Europe. And I'm going to um, share the presentation with you. Let me know if you can see it. Uh, I'm going to do it now. Can you see it now? I guess you can. Yes. Good. Okay, so um, before I say anything, okay, can I go? Okay. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to go through the concept of uh, renovations again. <laughs> I guess that I, everyone in the, in the room knows uh, about it. So what I wanted to say is that, uh, and you've already mentioned it, uh, like in Sweden and in other contexts, uh, tenancy law and civil law is like the, 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 the law that really regulates renovations. Like um, in this uh, horizontal re relation between landlords and tenants, this is regulated in mainly in civil law and tenancy law in a national level. But there is another dimension, which is the one that I wanted to bring into the, um, into the conversation is the, the obligations of states to guarantee human rights that come from the conventions that have been signed and ratified by, the, by all member states. And, and these binding obligations, they bind the state towards the citizens. So this is a more like a vertical relation in a way. And among the obligations of the states to guarantee the right to housing, there are these elements on the right to housing that are included, enshrined in human rights law, which is uh, the element that the adequate housing uh, part, the affordability of housing, the security of tenure. I think we've been talking about these three elements um, throughout the, the, the webinar. But uh, ultimately, what an eviction represents is the primacy of property and contractual rights over the human right to a home. I would say that. Uh, it's true that the right to property is not uh, an absolute right anymore. So there's this social function of property more and more uh, being talked about, but it's still in, 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 in tenancy law, the right to property, uh, it's, um, privileged. I cannot see you at all right now. So let's hope that I am. Um... We are hearing you. It's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> we we see you and we see your presentation. <laughs> Good. Uh, so one of the things that Tennessee law tries to do, I am not sure that it uh, actually uh, succeeds to do that. It's, it's to strike a balance between the rights and obligation of the parties. At least in the law, that's what they, they've tried for uh, decades to do, to balance between the rights and obligations of the different parties, of the two parties. But it's true, as the Swedish uh, um, colleagues have said, that uh, many times the, there's a huge gap between legislation and practice, okay? And obviously landlords, uh, in so many cases, they have, um, uh, a better position in this relationship. Um, so one of the things, before I talk about the international European um, tools, I would like to say that there's also the possibility of including additional protections in tenancy law, legislation that establishes 
for example, proportional increases in the rent. I think it's already been mentioned or implied in some of the uh, if your interventions. And I think uh, somewhere needs to be said that eviction should be a last resort. Uh, only in cases where there's bad contractual faith or non-respect of the obligations emanating from the rental contract, the eviction should take place, but not when uh, people cannot pay the rent because of the renovation for the, for the renovation, sorry. And of course, um, we've had our colleagues from the International Union of Tenants. It's important to um, go beyond the individual defense of the right to the collective defense of, uh, of the rights. So here, there's a, a huge role to be played by tenants associations throughout Europe. And now, um, I wanted to say just a word about rent control and renovations. You've already mentioned this as well. Uh, last year, we did a um, small uh, study on rent control mechanisms. Uh, all these rent control measures allow for limitations of the rent, especially in new leases. And um, there's always an exception to the limit to the rent increases, which is renovation. So when you renovate, um, normally this, that's an exception to the possibility of increasing uh, your rent. Uh, I wanted to mention something that um, I always do in the, when I mention rent control, which is the German Constitutional Court that found that rent regulations are necessary, that there are no other means that would be equally effective in the short term. And the legislator found a fair balance between the legitimate interest of property owners and the common good. There's also some kind of fair balance or balance that has to be made. And that's also uh, the approach that takes, for example, the European Court of Human Rights that I mentioned here in my slide, uh, that there's a need to strike a balance between the general interest and the landlord's rights. Um, there's also this notion of a reasonable and adequate rent. Uh, I just wanted to mention this before I enter into uh, a more international and European obligations, which is this, this new slide. So the binding obligations on evictions, like generally on evictions, uh, say that evictions must be established in a legal framework that is sufficiently protective for resident rights. Um, the legal protections normally must include uh, a prohibition to carry out evictions at night or in the winter, the possibility to access legal remedies, access to legal aid, and even compensation in case of illegal evictions. And the person's concern must have some kind of access to effectual, effective judicial remedy. So the judge has to be uh, uh, present or has to, has to uh, make a decision to protect the, the rights. Um, there's something called the proportionality assessment also in international uh, obligations. Uh, so any person that is threatened with eviction should have um, the opportunity to have the, the proportionality of the measure, so the eviction, assessed by an independent uh, tribunal. Uh, this, uh, so there has to be uh, specific attention to the consequences of an eviction when the person could become homeless. Um, another thing is when, when an eviction is justified in the public interest, I'm thinking of uh, evictions in um, public land, for example, state must rehouse the evicted households or provide them with fin financial assistance. And there's an obligation to consult the parties affected in order to find alternative solutions to eviction. And I wanted to mention these binding obligations, uh, and I want to bother you too much with um, legal staff, because I, I was going to mention the proportionality assessment here. So here, uh, you can see in the slide that I'm, I'm referring to the UN, to the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and, Com uh, uh, and Cultural Rights, sorry. This UN Committee has the possibility of receiving complaints, individual complaints uh, for violation of the rights of the covenant. And for example, there are hundreds of uh, decisions already uh, in, viola in violation of the right to housing, spe specifically from Spain. And I think this could be one of the 
tools that we could use um, to make the states accountable for drone evictions. For example, we could uh, argue that the, um, the eviction that takes place, uh, renovation uh, eviction, <laughs> is, a, is a disproportionate measure. So maybe we, can, we could take our case to the Committee of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and uh, ask them. So if, the, if they consider that there's a disproportionate measure um, that does not respond to an objective situation, for example. And um, I guess we could also ask the committee to ask the states for some kind of compensation mechanisms so that once there is a renovation, the tenants can remain in the housing. Um, I was thinking to prepare this presentation on what kind of arguments we could use. I mean, this is a completely uh, a speculative approach. I haven't. I don't have a case in front of me. So I was trying to imagine that if the rent goes up due to the energy efficiency improvements, normally the heating costs may, may, may go, go down as a consequence of this renovation. This is what I understand of uh, the different exchanges that I've been hearing. So my proposal will be that maybe the increase of the rent should only be to the extent so proportionate to the to the energy savings if you know what i mean so if the energy goes go down then the the increase of the rent could be proportionate to that one i don't know if i'm if it's if you can understand me yeah it, it is so, it is a, a, a principle that has often been um, used at least uh, uh, yeah uh, at the start, but there is something called the rebound effect, and actually it's very hard to calculate how much the cost of energy will decrease because mm. people want to benefit from, think, the, from the improvement. I think the idea here would be to calculate objectively somehow the proportionate rent so that the an eviction could only be enforced if, the, if this rule is breached. So it's, a good has... idea. it's a good idea for uh, for rent increase to in terms of scale scaling it up to that yes thank you sorry mm -hmm. for interrupting you no no it's okay it's just that i i, I was i i uh, it's better that that um, <laughs> that maybe that I, I would just wanted to make sure that you were following me because uh, this is just this argumentation that i was having uh, with myself and I don't know if uh, it makes sense because I, I'm not so aware of what's happening uh, in terms of uh, the directives of, of energy efficiency, um, what, what the discussions have been so far. Anyway, so this is one of the possibilities that we have. So uh, one individual complaint to the um, UN committee. Another, uh, I don't know if you can see the slide because in my screen is a bit cut. Yes. Uh, if uh, if you cannot see it, it says collective complaint to the European Committee of Social Rights at the top. So this is a, a completely different system. So it's the system of the European Social Charter with, with the Council of Europe. And there is an article in the European Social Charter that uh, recognizes the right to housing and the prevention of homelessness. And there's also the possibility of uh, some NGOs like FIANSA that has a have a participatory status with the Council of Europe to lodge collective complaints. So I was thinking that maybe a collective complaint could be launched to the European Committee of Social Rights, um, arguing that the state has implemented uh, renovation policies that generate evictions in breach of Article 31.2. And obviously, this is just um, my argumentation with myself without having a real case in front of me. So uh, you will be the, the, the ones to judge if this could be helpful at all. I could uh, probably uh, tell you more about the collective complaint mechanism later on if you have a doubt. Um, okay, so I'm going. 
another one. Um, I mean, this is not, I don't think we have a tool uh, at EU level to, to actually uh, like do a complaint, but maybe we can think together about it. So I, I started thinking about it, uh, having Article 7 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in my, in my head. So Article 7 says that everyone has the right to respect for his or her private and family life, a home and communications. This article it, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights corresponds to Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And um, this charter must be respected by member states and, and obviously the European Commission, all the, the institutions, when EU law is applied. This is something that is contained in Article 51 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. So I was thinking that maybe in all this um, EU legislation, um, we could argue that somewhere Article 7 was uh, violated um, if there was not a specific protection for vulnerable tenants risking the loss of, of their home. And uh, so, I mean, I said that there is not a tool, but there's always a possibility of uh, trying to, and this is not in our hands, uh, of using uh, the pre preliminary ruling. Um, so the national judge can request the Court of Justice or the, or the European Union uh, for a pre preliminary ruling. For example, uh, I don't know, may maybe there's a case uh, at domestic level where uh, as a consequence of renovations, um, several uh, tenants have been evicted. And then, so the national judge asks the European judge, is this uh, uh, in accordance with the European law or not? Is there a breach of Article 7 or not? So that's, that was something that uh, was, I was thinking about. Um, am I okay with time? Do I still have a, a bit of time left? How long? Uh, two, three minutes? Uh I mean, we, yeah, have okay. we have time, five minutes. Okay, so I'll go on. So and I just have a couple of more slides about recommendations that I can think of uh, um, at European level. Uh, one of them will be about the promotion of housing rights. So this connects with, with, um, with your um, suggestion, Clotilde, to, to talk about the right to housing. And I think um, we should try to promote the protection of the right to housing, defining um, eviction-related standards from the international instruments that I just mentioned and integrating them into national policies. That would be one of the, um, one of the recommendations that I would make. Um, created a legal obligation on courts and other agencies involved in evictions to inform uh, housing and social care agencies so that there was um, enough alternative housing or adequate support if the evictions take place in, in this case. Um, and also ensuring uh, respect of the right to legal aid, advocacy and representation in cases of, of evictions. The right to defense is really important in this case. So the possibility of the tenants to defend themselves when in court. Um, another recommendation will be better integrating housing consumers international and EU consumer protection policy. And obviously promoting and disseminating information on eviction related housing rights and putting into place enforcement procedures. I think we've, this, I've heard a lot of, uh, about enforcement procedures um, today, and I think that's um, one of the key issues as well. And I think our Swedish colleagues will be also pleased to hear that I also recommend some research at EU level, <laughs> because um, I, I think in FIANSA, but also in Housing Rights Watch, we, we, um, we find that there's um, 
room for improvement in the monitoring of, of evictions. Uh, this year we are uh, doing um, like a whole report uh, and the thematic focus is evictions and it's very difficult to find compatible that data between um, countries. I'm thinking in evictions in general, but obviously uh, in, in relation to evictions connected to, to renovation is the same thing. And uh, I think there's a lot of um, room to promote research into the personal and structural factors leading to evictions. Uh, also about the weaknesses in legal protection and countering illegal evictions. And uh, in terms of statistics, um, it's still uh, important to improve the, um, the basis for the EU seal questions on housing evictions uh, as a reason for change of dwelling, for example. And uh, I think more or less, this is what I wanted to say. Thanks for your attention. I had another slide, but um, I think I'm gonna leave it here. Maybe um, after that, I can ask, answer your questions. Thank you so much, Maria, for this uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, really uh, excellent um, to have the legal uh, legal perspective. Uh, it's very complementary. Um, so uh, please, if you have question, raise your hand uh, or put a question in the chat box. I have already some question. My first question to Maria. You started your presentation speaking about binding obligation coming from international law. Can you just clarify where does it come from, those obligations? Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I get I get very nervous and I forget to mention important things. So uh, they they come from international European conventions that the EU member states have signed and ratified, but they also come from the jurisprudence, um, meaning the, the jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights, um, the conclusions and the decisions of, of the European Committee of Social Rights, but also from some of the UN committees, specifically the um, the UN Committee um, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So, so that's why I didn't use in my presentation the judicial. So initially, initially, when I was suggested to speak about these questions, um, the 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 title was judicial tools. But some of the tools that we have are not judicial because they are. Um, some of the bodies that are, uh, let's say, supervising the respect of the right to housing in Europe are non-judiciary. So, okay. um, do you have um, example of case law relating particularly to renovation or ev eviction in connection to uh, regeneration programs or? No, you are not aware of case. Um, specifically. I'm not aware of case. I, I think that this is quite um, quite a recent, I, I, I'm not going to say new, because I know some of you have been researching this for years already. <laughs> but it I haven't found any renovation, uh, anything. Well, the, the term renovation is, uh, is quite new. So um, not from the top of my head. Okay, thank you. I just would like to reassure some participants who um, that Fianza really uh, wants the Green Deal and the upscaling of the housing stock to happen and that we, we're not going to launch into legal action to block uh, mandatory <laughs> energy performance standards from happening. Uh, but we're looking at, at what are the existing tools um, politically, but also regarding the tenant, tenant rights. Um, so I see two hands raised. Uh, okay, so Dominica. Can I just, yes, can yes. I just say? Can I just say something? This is just more an opinion than about tools. Um, just to say that I, I have the impression that, at least, when it comes to individual landlords, like I'm not talking about corporate landlords or social housing landlords. Um, I think the, the challenge is to, to really convince them when they don't have 
the means to do it that the house should be renovated. And I think, um, as you said, we really think that renovating housing has to happen. <laughs> so just to say that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. That's a very useful comment. Um, also, and, and then Dominica, please. Yeah, thank you, Maria, for a, a very interesting uh, presentation uh, with concrete ideas uh, and lots of information about the EU level. I wonder, this Article 7 that you talked about, um, to argue that these renovations are a violations uh, in the EU Charter, uh, you talked uh, about uh, how how like a national from a national scale like a national judge could actually you could you could take a case from a domestic level uh, and uh, and ask if it is um, is there a bridge like uh, in this article 7 and i wonder has that ever been done has it been done yet that uh, that a domestic case has Sorry. been raised and what is demanded for it to happen? How do you do, you know? Um, it has been used, Article 7, but in very few occasions. And it, I think actually there's at least the, all the mortgages cases that come from Spain. So uh, everything to do with um, unfair clauses in mortgage repossession cases, um, they have tried to uh, use Article 7 but there's one specific case, it's called Kushanova. Uh, Kushanova, so I think it's Slo Slovakia or Slovenia, I don't remember. Um, so Article 7 was um, used, but it's not very common. Like um, the EU Charter is still, um, unfortunately, not very used. Can I have a follow-up question? Okay, go on. <laughs> and then Dominica. Yeah, this you were also talking about making a common complaint. I didn't follow you. Was that not the Article 7? That was something else, right? But you talked in the beginning of the possibility of raising a common complaint. A collective no, a collective complaint. complaint. Collective complaint, yeah. Yeah, the collective complaint is a mechanism that was uh, introduced in the in in the framework of the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe it's forty seven countries, so it's larger than the European Union. Just for those of you that don't make the difference, the Council of Europe have has um, two different conventions: the Convention of Human Rights and the European Social Social Charter, the Revised Social Charter, which is the one that contains the right to housing. Okay, so in this context. The collective complaint mechanism allows organizations. Um, I'm thinking about Fianza, but at the um, I don't know, EAPN Europe, many organizations have the possibility of lodging collective complaints. How are they different for, from individual complaints? Because it's not about one single case, it's about a collective of people that are affected by laws or policies of a specific country. Uh, the good thing about collective complaint mechanisms is that you don't have to um, exhaust domestic remedies. Like uh, you can go to the European Committee of Social Rights and lodge a complaint uh, as long as you can uh, prove that there's a breach of one of the rights in the social charter and, and that you have evidences of the violation of these rights. I don't know if I'm answering your... Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can follow up on that uh, specific mechanism because FIANSA has uh, lodged some collective complaints, so we can follow up on that if you're interested. Dominica. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I think we all can agree that renovation is needed, uh, but the main question is who is to bear the costs and how much profit can you make of renovation, I think. 
Um, but uh, to the very interesting uh, material here, uh, Maria, um, uh, I have for years now um, discussed with different activists, but I'm not a lawyer and I'm not schooled in law, uh, which means that I have very practical questions on how do you formulate such a complaint? Uh, how do you do a collective complaint? And what kind of evidence is then needed? Because we have such, so we have we have so many cases of what you've mentioned, um, the breach of consum consumer protection, uh, people getting their uh, um, apartments uh, renovated without knowing how much this will cost them in the future. Uh, mm. Plenty of cases. So I mean, in terms of you are um, you are blind until there is a negotiation of the rent done after the renovation. Uh, plenty of cases in Sweden. We have uh, plenty of cases um, when the, uh, uh, tenants uh, get renovated. We have numbers on how many people need to move. Uh, we know that they keep on moving uh, and they are more or less chased by new renovations whenever they move. They, uh, they tend to move uh, again within two, three, four years, depending on where they move and when the, renew, the renovation is uh, initiated in the in the in the new housing, and we have also um, a breach of the right to defense in the Swedish case, since people or tenants in uh, ending up in the rent tribunal uh, are not guaranteed uh, legal aid. Uh, the tenants union would provide legal aid, but there is a policy to only provide legal aid uh, to successful cases, wh who, whatever cases are deemed successful. So most of the people uh, that would end up in uh, renovation cases in rent tribunal are representing themselves. And the property owners do have specialized professional uh, lawyers uh, with them. So, you know, the the power uh, imbalance that we've been talking about is so um, it's so clear to begin with, even. And maybe it's not surprising then that uh, uh, property owners or landlords are actually winning these cases because they have everything with. I mean, they. It's almost impossible to not win a case when you have the legal competence with you, uh, and the other part is not represented legally. So I have uh, I just, just uh, this is maybe not a question, but uh, how how can we join our, our forces? You know the knowledge we have on the the cases uh, in Sweden and actually make uh, um, this kind of complaint uh, on the EU level. Mm -hmm. I, I will uh, I will jump in and uh, ask Maria to respond very briefly because I think we could have a whole webinar on collective complaint mechanism and how to launch them and. And so maybe we can follow up on, on the legal uh, possible cooperation or input, but Maria, very briefly. Okay. Uh, listen, I, I totally, the complaint, the collective complaint mechanism is a very simple one. It doesn't necessarily need uh, much resources. You need someone who knows the law a bit. But uh, for example, one of the most successful collective complaints from Fianza was versus the Netherlands. And it was only like 20 pages. And it was very simple, uh, only three articles. Uh, we only uh, argue, argued the, the breach of three different articles. Uh, evidence was um, clear because there were violations that it was in journals, it was in everyday, it, it was about the, the access to shelter for, for, for migrants, undocumented migrants. And I think that's, that's um, easily doable. Collective complaints are not difficult. We are, we are currently um, preparing one against Sweden from some, for something different. So if you want to know about this more, just contact me. Um, Thank you. The power imbalance is great. It's huge. I mean, and I'm, I'm, I totally agree with you. Um, and that's why we, we need to keep on asking and demanding this because this is our rights. I mean, these are human rights, the right to defense. And um, unfortunately, together with all the um, 
how do you say savings austerity measures um one of the of the services that have more suffered throughout europe is the right to to justice the right to to, to uh, defense and it's not only in sweden it's throughout europe that uh this possibility has been reduced and this is something that i've always wanted to um, I, I didn't know how to tackle, like really, because this is um, difficult. But um, also, like a lack of resources in um, in in the national context, in tribunals. You have a specific tribunal in in Sweden that deals with um, with, with with rentals. That's not the case in in most of the European Union. Like uh, you are in in that in that respect quite privileged like to be totally honest because they are very specialized i'm not saying that you you get everything that you want obviously and i i, I understand that tenants are being evicted anyway so of course i'm not saying that your situation is positive but what i'm saying is that um having the resources in place is really important and uh, and activism in that res respect is really important because um, <laughs> I know about consumer law and EU law that's is, is more difficult like as I said we don't have like uh, a concrete specific tool that we can use directly ourselves at EU level so we need to uh, do it through the national domestic courts and then those judges can then raise the issue to the EU level if you know what I mean both about the consumer law, both about the breach of the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights and the different uh, fundamental rights that are enshrined in the Charter. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Um, maybe another disclaimer uh, is that we work a lot with the UIPI, which is the International Union of Property Owners. And I, I, really, I mean, it, it's clear it's a power uh, balance, but the idea of balancing, because we also have the case of uh, poor property owners, particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, we have the case uh, of property owners who would want to do the renovation, but who are elderly and don't know where to start with. So I'm bouncing back on the idea of access to information from owners as well. So yeah, I just, I just thought it was important to, to stress that out. Then uh, we have 10 minutes left. So as I see no more questions, I just want to conclude briefly uh, to first uh, by thanking the speakers again. Thank you for a very rich and interesting uh, uh, data you shared and the evidence that I think it will be very useful for us. What I have noted down is really the perspective of uh, this balancing perspective of housing in the one hand being increasingly perceived as a, a financial asset, and we see this move of financialization that must be counterbalanced by uh, housing as a human right. Uh, and different actions are possible at different level. Of course, there is a policy level at European and national uh, level to reflect the voice of tenants uh, and to address this power dynamic um, in, in, in the fair way, as, as fair as possible. There is also the issue of data. How can we uh, identify data gaps and better monitor, for instance, uh, eviction at national level, but also in terms of European trends, and specifically uh, eviction following on renovation or rent increase following on renovation. Uh, that's a very important ask of FIANSA to get a better picture of the social impact, because so far we have identified new research, research in Sweden, and the work of Catherine Grossman in Germany as well. But uh, apart from that, there is not so much data available on the social impact of, of renovation. Um, so I, I wrote down as well the tenant-centered approach with this double security of tenure and security of cost. You were mentioning that some tenants have, re have renovation going on and they have no idea what the cost will be afterwards. So, um, but again, we come to the idea of implementation because when we speak of the Green Deal and the renovation wave, the European Commission and the initiator are aware of the social risk. But the, the question is how do we prevent this renovation from turning into a, a displacement uh, wave uh, 
uh, and how can we make it happen even when we have the mechanism that then it, the safety safeguard mechanism will be implemented at national level. So there are some concrete political tools or, or legislation, legislative tools like rent caps uh, that was mentioned by um, Claudia in Canada. Um, of course, a renovation ban, but the issue is implementation. Uh, but also, Maria, you brought in the legal action uh, side. That's very interesting and, and complementary. Uh, legal action in, in two axes. Uh, first, the right to defense. So that was brought in by, by you also uh, and, and Dominica. Um, so that's something we should look into. How can we make sure that uh, tenants uh, have the right to defend themselves from rent increase or uh, eviction following on renovation um, and through maybe some of the mechanisms that Maya has mentioned. Um, I think those are the, the key things for me. Oh, and the last element is, of course, um, it was brought in by Claudia as well. It's the element of public housing, and it's linked to housing as a public good, housing as a human right. How can we increase or advocate for an increase in social housing, co-op, or, um, or to convince property owners uh, through mechanisms like social rental agencies, to rent at a fair rent or at even a below market price on some occasion. So uh, that's it for me. I just want to thank speakers again, but also very specifically Alice, who organized everything. Thank you very much, Alice, for, for all of your work on that. Alice will also actually um, publish a briefing on renovation in cooperation with the uh, Budapest-based uh, Metropolitan Research Institute to look at renovation, um, particularly in Eastern and, and, and Central Europe from their perspective, and Alice will bring in the, the Western Europe perspective. So watch this space, uh, Piantra is working on it, and we are looking to develop cooperation maybe with International Union of Tenants uh, and other partners on that uh, to work for a socially fair renovation way. Thank you so much to you all, and we'll follow up by email. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Ciao. much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Thank you.